Okay, so good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Aisha. I'm the chair of IEEE Women in Engineering Albuquerque Section Affinity Group. And for today, we have Dr. Linda Katehi from Texas A&M University joining us as our key speaker, and we thank her very, very much for joining us out of her very busy schedule. We are truly, truly honored for you to join us. Thank you. So let me introduce her just a little bit. Uh, Dr. Linda Kati is the Odenel Endowed Chair in Engineering and a Distinguished TEES Chair Professor of Electronics in the Electrical and Computer Engineering, as well as the Material Science and Engineering Departments at the Texas A&M University at College Station. She is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy for Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Innovators, and a Fellow of IEEE. From 2017 until 2020, she has served as the president-elect, president and past president of the Women in Engineering Professional Advocacy Network. Moving on to her research interests, Professor Katihi's research focuses on the design and the development of intelligent edge RF electronics, an area that involves analog hardware algorithm co-design, deep machine learning and neuromorphic computations for the development of electronic components and systems that can evolve, evolve the performance of the basis of the operational space and collected data. Thank you very much, Dr. Katihi, for joining us today. Before we start today's talk, I believe Dr. Tsiropolo would like to say something. Thank you, Aisha, and uh, thank you, Dr. Katihi, uh, for joining us today. So uh, your resume is really long and really prestigious, so uh, I'm not going to, you know, stick on the all the awards and all the achievements, but I want to share because a lot of uh, young women in engineers are uh, uh, may watch this video, I want to share a little bit of personal story um, about Dr. Katehi. So I don't know her personally, and actually I've never met her in my life, but uh, it feels that I know her very well uh, because we share the same uh, alma mater in the undergraduate degree, uh, the National Technical University of Athens, uh, which is the top university in engineering in Greece, and especially in the period that Dr. Katehi uh, graduated from there, uh, the female students were extremely few. So the entrance to the university is very tough, with very tough exam, uh, national exam, uh, mainly in math, physics, uh, and general science-related courses. So. Uh, being one of the few is really difficult. And it's not only that, um, I can say that she was a legend. I guess she still is back in TNTUA. And even if we have some years of difference, uh, it's amazing that her name was still around at NTUA even after uh, so many years. And as a younger engineer, I could be inspired uh, by her path in academia. And that was my personal story. And uh, we are very, very honored that we have you here today. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I, um, I really did not know that people will know me back there at the university. Um, I, I have to say that, uh, yes, uh, when, we, when I got there in, 1972, many years back, uh, we were only two girls among 180 um, young men at the time in um, in the first year in the university. It was a different system, obviously, but um, yeah, it was uh, for me a very um, different environment. I, at, at the time, the um, schools, the high schools were like um, for girls and for boys separate and um, to prepare for the entrance examination to the university I moved from the island where I, I, I was I had you know been I was born and had uh, been raised to uh, we moved to Athens to go to one of the two schools at the time um, for girls to be prepared 
primarily for a um, for the sciences. And um, in that two years that I spent there, we were only girls, you know, and then I never really thought uh, up to that point that girls would not be good in math and science because all of the girls that I met <laughs> had really were were brilliant in that um, in those areas. However, I have to say when I moved from that high school to um, the university, I just realized how few um, women were young women were attracted to engineering or were able even to go that far as to enter engineering and for a number of reasons, but I think mostly because the inaccessibility for women at the time to schools that would prepare them competitively uh, for an entrance to this uh, to this university. I have to say, I agree, it's a great place, a great university, still is uh, for all of these years. And I'm very happy now to know that there are many more women who go there. But just a little bit about myself. Um, I left, I, I graduated from the university in 77 after five years in a five year program. And then I worked for two years, two and a half years um, in a with a group uh, that was doing work on radars. And then I realized that I was interested in going to for to graduate studies, uh, starting graduate studies. And in Greece at the time, we did not have well-formed graduate schools. As a matter of fact, um, I think very few they, they were not giving PhDs at that point in time. And now it, it is different, obviously. And so um, I came to UCLA. Uh, my husband and I came at the same time to UCLA. I, um, I had met my advisor while he was doing his sabbatical leave in Greece and I was a, a junior um, undergrad and we did some work together and we published the work. So that's how I ended up getting to know him. And then he had invited me to go to graduate school, but I was not interested <laughs> right after college. But uh, two and a half years later, I took his offer. And in September of uh, 1977, I started at UCLA. I finished there my master's and PhD in 1984. And then um, my husband also in chemical engineering, we moved together to Michigan. And I went to um, the University of Michigan as an associate professor. He started working for GM in the research labs. And we stayed in Michigan. I stayed there as a faculty member until 2001. Um, went through all of the ranks um, of the professorship. And then I uh, became a dean. Um, before that, I was in part-time an associate dean for academic affairs. Um, and, the, and before that, an associate dean for graduate school and then academic affairs. And then eventually, I uh, was given the opportunity to become the Dean at Purdue. 2002, I started in January. And um, I stayed there until 2006 uh, as the Dean. And then I moved to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as the provost. Um, at the same time, I was doing research also because I never wanted to leave that part of my life. I really always liked, and I still do, you know, research is the one thing that fulfills me tremendously. However, I moved on the um, administrative ladder because I thought always that there is an opportunity to do, uh, to make a change in the profession, especially to change the environment for women. I was having gone through a period of time when women um, were very few to be found in engineering. And for that reason, um, the environment was not a, a, any welcoming one. Um, so I, I wanted to change this for future generations. And that's how I ended up going to administration. Um, from uh, University of Illinois to Urbana-Champaign uh, in 2009, I moved to UC Davis as the chancellor. And at that point in time, I realized how far away from my own discipline I was. And I had decided that after I finished my term as a chancellor, that I would go back to my own research. 
which in fact I was able, I got, I went on a sabbatical leave in 2016 for the first time. I had never ever had a sabbatical leave <laughs> in my whole career up until that point, but I thought it was critical because I wanted to go back to research, but I wanted to do something totally different from what I had done in the past and then do something that was at that point in time, looking forward, the what I was considering to be the next generation of the types of electronics I was doing in my research. And so I went on this sabbatical leave and then I traveled quite a bit. I looked at, I, I spoke with people who were doing work in, it was not called intelligent electronics, but more in, especially people in robotics who were thinking about how to make um, robots to be more independent. And therefore they were thinking about the ability of those structures to make their own decisions independently. And then I came back, um, it was UC Davis, but um, I kept thinking about how to bring those capabilities for learning and independent decision-making to electronics. And it took me some time really to decide on how to accomplish that. So um, I, I read a lot um, across many different disciplines. And what I wanted to do today is to present in some ways a summary of what I learned about intelligence and what I learned, um, how I le what I learned about how nature has um, evolved intelligence in many species, and how we can take some lessons from that and translate those lessons into things we can do in electronics. So that's how I have structured my presentation. And I will try to go that uh, within the allot allotted time. So then we can have a discussion or I can get different questions. So unless you have, thank you, first of all, for the introduction. Thank you for reminding me about my previous institution that I really have very deep in my heart. Um, and I can respond to any other questions about my career or about this work after we are done with my presentation. If that's okay, then I will start. Okay. So um, I selected this and you see the name is Embodied Intelligence in Electronics. And the name Embodied has meaning. So, and I will explain that as we go through this. So let me see how, okay, I will move that. Hmm. All right, there with a click. Um, my area of expertise has been a, a communications, high frequency communications. And um, I started at a time or, or working in this area when we did not have wireless. Uh, we only had radars, so that was the wireless component, all right? So, and as I mentioned, I worked on radars while I was in Greece um, for two and a half years. And that was, in fact, um, the only area that involved electromagnetics. And for many years um, after I came to the U.S., my work was primarily antennas, but most of the antennas um, were either for large ground stations, like antennas for communications with satellites or um, antennas for deep space ob observations or antennas primarily for military applications, for radars. And um, since then, of course, things have totally changed with wireless communication. So today, as you can see, we have 120 billion users. I mean, many more than the number of population of uh, humans on this planet. And of course that is because users are not, most of the users are not humans. Most of the users are machines. And um, I have here, a shows exactly where those machines are in space, um, close to us, far from us, um, on the surface of the earth, between people, uh, between people and machines, um, between machines. And primarily it is between machines that most of the data are communicated. So to um, move off a little bit and keep um, our 
eyes on the data as um, multiple as we have a growth in users primarily because of machines. Well, what do machines communicate? Primarily data. And um, what you can see here is just very recently, um, the last say 20, 12 years, all right? Um, on how it shows how the data we are producing is growing is not only data we're producing, but data we are storing and data we are communicating. And how now, according to just the last few projections or the last many 10 year projections, we are seeing that by 2025, which is like three years from now, the amount of data that we will be storing and communicating will be of the order of 180 zettabytes. And one zettabyte is 10 to the 21st. And these are not just bits, they are bytes, all right? So they, it's, it's a, a lot more if you translate that into bits. So from here, um, the question is, okay, well, what does it cost to keep this data and to communicate them? So here on the left, you see, as a matter of fact, a forecast in terms of electricity, because obviously all of the um, data centers and all of the machines that communicate data among those centers and among the machines use electricity. So here you see the energy increase specifically for the energy that is utilized to save data in data centers, to communicate data between networks, wireless and wired. And for then the yellow and the red is production for the uh, devices that do the communication. And then of course, consumer devices and so forth. A consumer device can be any sensor that has a wireless device on it. And then from there, um, you can then ask the question, okay, if we are a primary, because you can see by 2030 will be 30%, so the data related activity will be 30% of the total um, usage of electricity will be responsible for 30% of uh, usage of electricity. But if you see how electricity on the next uh, uh, plot, if you see how electric electricity grows, it is the uh, fastest growing among all of the other sectors of energy. And the growth is primarily coming from data not from um, other uses. And then from there you can see, so now the story comes that electricity from all other sources of emission, of greenhouse gas emissions, electricity is the one that is mostly responsible for growth. And while the other sectors either have been studied steady have reduced uh, slightly or are growing, but with a much lower derivative, if you like, uh, rate of change. Electricity is growing by a lot with a, a much faster, let me put it this way. And if you look at these three curves, that is easy to make the uh, conclusion that it is data is the primary reason why we electricity usage is growing and is the primary one of the primary reasons anymore for the uh, greenhouse emissions. So then the question has been, um, okay, so how can we really avoid that? Um, uh, well, it, 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 the, the, it is a simple question, but the answers have not come easily, I have to say, but it, all now, all of us agree that one thing to address that issue in terms of data, because it's not only the energy that of course is very important, all right, but it's not only that, that we have a problem. M the more the data we communicate, the more um, that we have to spend to retrieve them and then use them and then restore them, um, the the low the slower or the the um, longer it gets in terms of time, 
to have specific tasks executed. And we call that latency of the systems. So not only we have increased energy usage, but also we have increased latency. And neither of the two is uh, helping us with communications, with information exchange and so forth. So the whole um, uh, response to that from industry and of course from the research community is that we have to reconsider how and where we process data. Ideally, we would like to process data right at the sensor. And that's what, um, in fact, I mean, if we could, we would process them all there and translate them into information. Of course, it's not possible for a number of reasons, but primarily because the volume of data in many sensors, especially in electromagnetic sensors, it comes at a very high rate. And we don't necessarily have the means to do the processing at the sensor level at the same rate with the existing technologies or existing approaches that we have taken. And of course, in addition to that, we don't know ahead of time exactly what information we want to extract. A lot of times it takes an effort as you start extracting information to understand really how much more you are looking into. In any case, um, the whole thing therefore comes around to the following question. How can we make a decision as close to the sensor as possible of what information we need and how to use it? And the answer is that the only way to do that is by introducing intelligence, not just in the system, in the whole system of communication, but specifically introducing intelligence at the edge. So primarily the whole idea here with the schematic is that we like to put something like a brain inside a microprocessor. Now, let me go back because um, that, the idea that I, or at least the interest that I have, my research interest is in uh, 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 giving a, an answer to that question of how can we really address the issue of data and of latency. And I started reading different things, but here I will put the things that remained with me as I was learning about intelligence. First of all, is about a philosophy that has um, underlined all of the work that we have done as researchers. Um, all of us, we know about the Cartesian intelligence. This is really a philosophy that was developed by Descartes who said the very famous, um, I think, therefore I am, which meant that, you know, I the brain is the center of our activities. And because of that, because we have the capacity to think, therefore we have the ability to consider ourselves as an entity, um, as therefore have this sense of being. Now, before then, and that was lost somehow in the history as it happens with a hum the human race. A lot of times, you know, new, new, new events um, erase old thoughts, at least in the past, uh, much easier because there was no way of um, easily communicating as it is today. But there was a previous philosophy about intelligence and that was the Aristotelian philosophy that said, that, that in fact Aristotle believed in inductive inference. What said primarily is that intelligence was the result of observations and learning, all right? So it was the result of having the ability to sense uh, the environment and learn from experiences. So um, if we were to draw an equivalent to what Descartes said, I would say Aristotle in the same words would say that I think because I learn, all right? So that was very fundamental, that thinking is the result of learning and learning is not the result of thinking. So that was the, the difference between the two philosophies. And you can say, well, how did these change your thoughts about what to do with your electronics? Well, it does because primarily it helps you put in order 
learning and thinking. So if I were to be able to do those things in electronics, I will focus on learning first. And then I would ask the question, now that I learn, how do I translate that into thinking? And specifically not I as a person, but I as a designer of electronics. So um, another thing that I've learned, which was also extremely interesting, um, I learned that we don't necessarily have the right vocabulary as engineers or as a, a scientist when it comes to intelligence. Cognition, we use the words cognition and intelligence in, um, interchangeably, and that is not necessarily correct. So cognition is the process of learning, but intelligence is the ability to go through this process and the ability from the learning from this process to decide independently. So when we say some a cognitive radar, we talk about a radar that has the ability, has the structure, has the hardware, if you like, or the software, the algorithms, to um, learn and make decisions. But intelligence is the result of that cognition. So that was number one, because I have to tell you, um, there are whole uh, papers <laughs> in, in philosophy that write about those things. Second, um, what we learn from nature is that learning, at, first of all, in terms of cognition, which is an, a process of learning, all right? The process of learning is not centralized in one place. It's not in the, in, in the brain, it's not at the sensor, it's distributed throughout from the sensor to the brain. And so that was number one. And that is extremely important because on how on learning how nature has done that to be able in some ways not to replicate nature. So I don't believe that can be done, but to learn from how nature have, has found ways to do things efficiently and effectively in terms of energy. So a distributed process of cognition and eventually distributed intelligence, what we call, is extremely important. So for example, I have the octopus here because it's a animal that, a uh, species that has been studied extensively. And now I think it's gonna be protected because people found that uh, an octopus has this, the, the intelligence of a five-year-old. It can think, it can play, and it has feelings about others in the, their communities and about, um, in fact, other species with which either is, is gonna fear them or is going to like them, depending on their interaction. The other thing is that the, the octopus has multiple uh, lobes in the brain and each one of them has a particular function. So there are a lot of neurons in the octopus on its skin, which means that there are decisions made independently of the one single lobe that's behind the eye, one eye that the octopus has. And why is that? Because why do we not have the same kind of thing? Because we have a skeleton and a skeleton provides to us for our brain a point of reference. So our brain has a smaller replica of our body, but because of the skeleton, it can always identify the right place. For example, we learn how to pick up a pen from the table, all right? To be able to do that, to guide our hand and pick up a pen like I do from the table, needs to have, our brain needs to have a, like a, a micro graph, if you like, of our body to be able then with simple cal calculations, make the decision of how far to extend my hand so that I grab the pen instead of touching something else. And you can see a lot of the babies when they learn, they don't have that capability, but eventually it is developed. In octopus, because it has seven, eight legs, excuse me, and um, 
and uh, they are all soft. There is no skeleton. So there is no one single point of reference. And for the brain of the octopus to be able to do very complex calculations so it could control each one of these eight legs independently, it would have been so slow that the species would not have survived it. So what happens, every leg decides on its own on how to move. So when, for example, is searching to understand other, because it cannot see very well. The octopus has the and one eye cannot see very well. Usually it is the feelings from the skin that helps the octopus identify objects. And so whenever you see that it uh, curls its legs around something, it's practically because it tries to understand. So um, the decision about curling your leg around something is a local decision in the octopus. It does not come from the brain. Usually what comes from the brain is if or multiple legs identify a threat, then that goes the information from the neurons on the skin, on the, the legs, to the central brain, which then gives one... Um, direction to the octopus to live. And then when that happens, it lives extremely fast. So that was the other um, recognition. Um, now moving, let me see, to um, what more we learn other than the octopus. We learned that um, nature has managed to develop um, advanced learning with limited number of neurons. And why am I saying that? Because we have the capability to print billions of transistors. And as a matter of fact, we have uh, the iPhone that has a few billions of those. At the same time, we don't use them effectively, all right? I mean, our, our iPhone does not have even the intelligence of a round worm. So uh, the round worm, people have done research on that. Of course, they, they, have, they have mapped uh, all of the brain of the worm and all of the neurons and all of the synapses between the neurons. That has been mapped. You see, in fact, one here on how some neurons are excited specifically when it, it gets to do specific things. So there are only 305 neurons and there are the maximum 17,000 synapses. However, this has abilities that our iPhone does not have. The round worm can be sensitive, can sensitize and, and protect itself from temperature, from light, um, and it socializes. They like to socialize, if you can believe that. They like to be all together. So um, it senses when there are other worms and makes the decision to join them. And I don't know exactly, they have not decided exactly <laughs> what they, how they communicate when they get together, if they do, or if they, by other means, trying to feel a sense of security. And of course, um, to reproduce, all right? Reproduction is extremely important to the species as well. But it has capabilities for adaptation to the environment that our iPhone does not have. And as a matter of fact, many other things we have created and we are proud of do not have. Now let's go to the human brain. The human brain has 16 billion neurons in what is called the cerebrum and has 69 billion neurons in a cerebellum. And so the brain also, as we will see, and people have don't have not done as much understanding of the brain. Obviously, for example, you don't you cannot experiment on human beings or even animals, which are at the higher level of um, of cognition than the roundworm. But um, they have done a lot of studies with MRIs that they have been able to make an images through imaging. They have been able to um, get a lot of information. And so if I were to continue in that, I would like to go back a few years because what we know right now is that there was a time of almost 1.5 million years when our brain grew tremendously. 
uh, people think that the part of the brain that is the most now, this is very recent in the last few years, people have learned that the part of our brain, which is the most archaic, but the most um, important and the most complex in terms of what it produces, like our, our the way we feel, our emotions, for example, our understanding of being, um, our creativity, um, and all of the other complex kinds of uh, ways we behave of behavior, they all come from the cel cerebellum, from this smaller part which is back at our at our head that has sixty nine billion neurons. The um, cerebral part of our brain grew um, in close to 1.5 million years. And that's why our head also changed its shape to accommodate the growth. <clears throat> and it's not necessarily the one that creates all of these complex um, thoughts and behaviors, but is the one that um, it, it provides space for what we call today the working memory. And so, the other thing that people now, uh, with all of the means we have for DNA um, analysis and uh, the, uh, in anthropology with uh, what we have found so far, uh, the, the, the prevailing theory is that that growth in the in, in cerebral cortex happened because for this many years, and that started about one and a half million years ago, people were doing repetitive um, things. So for example, up before Homo sapiens and even with Homo habilis, people have found um, that they were making stone tools. And stone tools are very difficult to make when you, you use another stone to make a tool that will have for example, you can use a, like a knife to cut skin or to cut meat or to cut other things that they needed for their food and to cover themselves later. But to cover those, to create those tools, it does require tremendous repetition and learning from others. And it was for these many years when people were creating tools that their brain grew which means it's like, think of it as the following. Think the, of, the, of the, our brain as having hardware, which are neurons and the synapses, and then a software, an embedded algorithm, which has the capability to rewrite itself and become more complex and responsive. And at the same time, because of that has the capability to even grow the hardware. So that is the amazing thing that our brain does. It's like a, a, a structure, like it, it's, 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 um, it, it's not just muscle, all right? It's not, there's no muscle. It's not just, you know, a material. It's like hardware and software, both of them totally integrated with their ability to interact and then grow both on their own. But what really is the basis for that growth and expansion in terms of abilities rather, is learning and learning through repetition. So that takes me, uh, well, this is something about the neurons. I wanna make sure that I have the time. Um, and how they are connected and all of the other things that we are learning. I mean, it's amazing the learning that has happened in neuroscience, in brain science the last few years. So from here, um, I talked a little bit about the sensor and how much processing is done at the sensor vis-a-vis -vis the processing that is done along the way. So one of the sensors that we have learned, we have uh, studied very successfully is the eye, which is considered to be probably the most um, advanced sensor in our body. The eye is like a, the lens of a camera. Every pixel 
receives um, light or photons. And as the photons, you know, um, create the photons create electrons. And as the number of electrons grow, then at some point you have enough uh, e electric signal or a potential difference, you like, if you like, that uh, changes into an electric signal. And that then is communicated. Now, what happens is that every one of these uh, currents that is created and they are, it's electrons moving through like uh, fibers like of lines. Um, every one of these um, has, and it's anal analog obviously, but has uh, information, all right? The amplitude of this current, um, which is like changing constantly, gives us uh, information about the intensity of light and colors and so forth. Um, our uh, retina is an amazing um, processor. It processes the data right there. And as a matter of fact, at the retina, the data with processing, they go from, they reduce in number as you go from data to information by almost 100,000. So after it leaves the retina, it is already information that is being developed. And that information then through the optical nerve goes to the brain. So for example, now I'm focusing, uh, well, let me say one more thing. Now it goes to the brain and still at the brain, at that level, there is a lot more information that arrives, but only a portion of that information is recorded and is stored. So for example, let me give you now an example in, in, in real time. Um, I'm trying to give this presentation, so I'm looking at the screen. And however, my eye gets information from everywhere as far as it can go and see, all right? So uh, my lens gets information from everywhere. And a lot of this information is translated into currents, goes through the uh, retina, and eventually goes to the brain. However, I do remember what I'm saying and of course what I look at, but I don't remember what happens across from me on the wall in this room for which I get the information. It goes to my working memory, but then it, it is eliminated because it's not important. Now, if something happens all of a sudden and, and, and I see that something is thrown at me from one side, then obviously that event is gonna change my attention. And then eventually in that in working memory, the decision is going to be made that that event is important and is going to be recorded. So why am I explaining this? Because it helps us understand that processing of information start, goes through from the sensor all the way later in the brain when an assessment is made about which events are important to keep. So that's what, in fact, it talks about um, working memory, which is something I tell my students. First of all, if we are to keep information, we have to recall information. If we don't recall information, it never gets recorded. And that's number one. So <laughs> I was telling my students, if you come to my class and I teach you and then you go and do something else and then you come two days later or next week to come and hear of the topic, most probably you're not gonna remember anything. And I will have to start from the beginning trying to have you relearn what I said last time. However, if you spend a little bit of time every day trying to recall what we discussed, the brain is gonna record it, which is an amazing thing because I don't believe at least I was not told that this is how we learn. <laughs> I always thought that somehow, you know, whatever we learn goes into our brains, gets stored somewhere and then I can use it. That's not true. It is not even get stored, all right? It's like not existing anymore for us. But all of this is um, also information for us to see after we use all of this information in the circuits, do we store all of this? No, we store only the information that is important, is considered critically important at that point in time. So the question that I had 
with all of this is what does that all of this information mean when it comes down to taking, as you see here, this is a a picture, you know, more more of this that says, well, how do I take all of this information and make it a microchip? So um, that only says what I've been discussing, that uh, edge intelligence is extremely important. It's an important solution to the data problem we have. And of course, learning from nature is extremely important. So I started in the beginning thinking, OK, now that I know all of this, what am I going to do with that? Um, on the left, is, it will show you exactly what we have at this point in terms of um, a reference, like a receiver or a transceiver, which is a transmitter and a receiver. You always need to remind you that that's my area of expertise in um, high frequency communications. And so the traditional is what we call a deterministic system. What is a deterministic system? It's a system that you design under very specific conditions. And if you specify, uh, um, it's like any boundary value problem. If you specify all of the conditions in all of the boundaries, whether they're time and time in frequency in space and all of these, then practically you will only find a unique solution to this problem usually for well-defined problems. That means that in deterministic systems, we define all of these conditions and we saw and we create systems that solve only one particular problem. This is not how nature works. Nature does not have deterministic systems like the transmitter we have here. Nature works with stochastic systems. What does that mean? That the systems, those systems can handle uncertainty. That's how we learn. If we were to uh, be a system that cannot handle uncertainty, we will never be able to have the capability to learn something. So that is number one. Number two, what you see here is how do we distribute information, all right? So that is the mapping of a distributed architecture in terms of learning. So you start with the uh, sensors on the left hand, you have you can have a radar, you can have antennas, you can have a MIMO for um, multi-input and multi-outputs for communications. And then you have what we call the sensory transduction, which is the place where we do the first uh, information processing, I mean, data processing. <laughs> and for that, we use clearly stochastic systems, like uh, we do, uh, uh, co-design of hardware and software. And we embed the algorithms on the hardware. I will show that next. And then you move at a higher level where you take this uh, information from multiple sensors and you fuse it. That's what our brain does, as a matter of fact, at different stages. But it, fusion of information is extremely important before a decision is made. So that is the second. Uh, stage. And then from there on, depending on how much more information you need, you may have to do more specific processing. So that is a the architecture of the system. Um, for us, we want to do all of this on a microchip, obviously. Um, we What I, I'm thinking is the development of a coprocessor that has both analog and digital, which we can do using uh, silicon-based right, uh, technologies, where you have um, your different, uh, like here is, a, it could be a radar, it could here, it could be any other sensor, could be a BIMO for communications. And then you bring them, all of these sensors, send their uh, data all in analog form. The data come and they're processed uh, either individually or together, depending on whether the signals or the events we are sensing have a compatible um, time scale or they are at different time scales. If there are different time scales, will have to be processed separately. If they are if the time scales are compatible, then you can fuse them before the processing, and then you can process them, and then you can recognize what each one of them means or is. 
And so um, this is how we were thinking of using, and, uh, and we have, of using what we call a memory store crossbar configuration that gives us the opportunity to embed what you see the red ones are memory devices. So there you can embed the coefficients of the machine learning algorithms. So you have a hardware with embedded algorithm in there. And um, that of course, it, when you start go going more and more into the details, it gets a little more complex, but all of this can be done on a, a microchip. That is called also in sometimes, especially when it's done in the digital domain, it's called in-memory computation, which means that exactly what I showed you before, that you um, put your algorithm into memory and then you compute there using crossbar configurations. And um, these red elements that I showed you between these crossing bars are nothing else but memory devices made out of memory materials. And there are a number of memory materials people are looking at at present. And finally, um, you will have a chip or a chip that has both, you know, analog and digital, which what that here shows you, you can receive a signal that is modulated. And then eventually you can find the, uh, what I, we call in communications, the I and Q channels, which is nothing else, but an intermediate signal that eventually gives you um, the symbol uh, of the modulated signal and eventually will help you decode it for the information. So um, at this point we have, I will stop here. At this point we have demonstrated, we just did um, first measurements last summer. We demonstrated practically that um, by using these, we can have a circuit like on one microprocessor that can sense electromagnetic signals and can classify them like a radar signal from a Wi-Fi signal from a OFDM signal. And um, it can classify them, um, you train it ahead of time at this point. Eventually it can it can change itself if we embed a, a lifelong learning algorithm, but it has the capability right now with very simple processing to classify those signals and eventually see what parts of the spectrum is not utilized. So you can eventually utilize it. What is the direction of arrival and things like that. In any case, so what I wanted to step finish is let's say after almost six years since I came back to my research. Now we have some very good results that show both theoretical and experimentally that it is possible. I mean, we have opened the way now to start thinking of uh, circuits that have the ability to learn and do processing up front without a lot of energy and eventually we'll be able to make um, autonomous decisions. Of course, all within, I will never recreate a human. That's, I don't want to say that. Um, that's not possible, obviously. But we can learn a lot from nature. It's not necessarily from humans, from other animals, on how learning takes place and eventually to combine that to make some simple decisions that we can make early. And primarily for us, it's mostly getting information out of, so we get rid of all of this data we send back and forth, you know, and then we um, expend so much energy. So that is what I wanted to, where I wanted to add, uh, to end, and I will open it up to any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasugi. It was a wonderful talk, a very informative one indeed. So anyone from the audience, if you have any question, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Or you can also raise your hand and use the chat section if you don't have a microphone with you. Oops. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Kapil. I'm uh, Satman. So I, I had a question for you. Uh, yes. So I, 
I, I found that uh, there are the you are trying to implement some deep learning models into the hardware, mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, and yes. uh, and and there are like quite a few layers within the model. So mm -hmm. my question was, uh, I mean, for implementing such models uh, outside the hardware, let's say in a software scenario, requires a lot of processing power, and or we often use GPU or other. Uh, processors in addition to what we have to support this uh, deep models. So uh, how do you tackle this processing issue in a hardware level? So that is the training process. Yes, and training, yeah, unless you develop a yeah, lifelong learning algorithm, training is done off-site. So you train your um, model. The good thing is that if you want to train it for a particular processing, you don't need to retrain it again, all right? So you train it once and then you can replicate it on multiple microprocessors. So if, say if, if the only thing that I wanna do is develop a learning algorithm, a, a, a machine learning algorithm that allows me to process high frequency signals and from there go to baseband and um, do classification of the spectrum if that's my goal. I don't necessarily need to uh, retrain it every time. I train it once and then I let it work. In that case, it's not gonna learn on its own. However, the next uh, effort is to look into learning algorithms, which um, will be able to change themselves on the basis of what they, the new things they see. The memory devices are, first of all, non-volatile, and second, they're reprogrammable. So you can develop a control circuit with CMOS, which is gonna be able then to help you on the basis of what you learned to, I mean, the, for the software, to be able to reprogram the memory devices and therefore introduce the new learning into the, um, into the algorithm, if you like, which is embedded. In that case, you don't need to take them off and train them again. Um, so that is the other thing. But um, yes, in training, you need to have a lot of data and you need to use GPU to do it fast. I agree, it's not something that you will do real time. If you wanna be able to learn, you have to develop, we will have to implement lifelong learning, learning algorithms for that. Thank you, Professor. Everyone. Anybody else? Okay, I may... Oh, oh sorry, Fisagio, is that you? Yes, that's, that's me. Yeah, so mine is mostly just like a, a general question right so like um how did you um just easily adapt to like life after phd like you know going through all the rigors of like you know like a phd program and just making a decision to like pursue something like what was that period like for you yes very stressful <laughs> Because I have to say for when I came from Greece um, to the US, I found it difficult. The, first of all, it was a um, long time ago when we did not have easy means for communication. I found myself away from my family. And that was very difficult. If you know, you know, Greek families are very tight. And I left behind my friends. Um, but I but I wanted to go to graduate school. I mean, I wanted to learn more. And so I came here with my husband. We came and uh, we decided, okay, let's try to do a master's first and see maybe we'll go back to Greece. But by the time we got our master's, we said, okay, let's try to get our PhD. I mean, we were very, we were learning then and it was like very exciting, you know, to be in this phase in your life when you learn things um, that excite you. And then uh, we decided, okay, let's work a little bit. Um, that's when we, I went to the University of Michigan. I was not sure in the beginning 
I mean, I applied and uh, they recruited me. Uh, they hired me. Um, I was not sure in the beginning I wanted to stay in a university, but I loved it. I mean, working with students, having the ability to decide what you're going to do on one end is not an easy thing to do right after being a graduate student when you are giving guidance, all right? I mean, the transition from that stage to becoming an independent researcher and then have others to um, guide, it was not obvious to me, but I learned it. Um, and I love the university environment. I never thought that I was going to leave ever the university to work for a company. Uh, obviously, there are people with different uh, needs um, that appreciate different things, that different things make them happy, rather, that may decide, for example, to work for industry and then can find wonderful careers there. But I have to say, it was not a, it, while I did not have issues during that period, it was stressful. Um, I remember when my first student came, he was a couple of years older than I was because he was working in industry. And then I was thinking, well, I can hardly do the things I need to do myself. What am I going to ask him to do? That's what I was thinking. Um, because as a graduate student, you don't, you know, the only thing that I knew is how much more I do not know, to tell the truth. I was extremely terrified going into class, giving a a lecture and then having to answer questions that I maybe did not know the answer to. <laughs> That's what I was afraid. Um, but all of this with support from other faculty, you know, it all goes away eventually. And um, yeah, it takes a year, a couple of years to get uh, into the mode of the, of the, of academia. Um, but I liked it. Very much. One thing I need to add to it. I had my advisor who was extremely helpful. So always having a good mentor you can rely on, that you can share with whom you can share your anxieties, your questions, you know, ask if you don't know something, you can call. And you know that they're not going to judge you. Because there are so many more things, especially your advisor, if you have a good relationship with your advisor and they know you as a graduate student, they are the best person, you know, to come back and say, how would I do this? I have this problem. Could you help me think through it? They will do that. And that's what my advisor was wonderful, really, has been a wonderful person uh, in my career, my life too, who really loved me and my husband He and his wife too and his children i mean i i speak with him uh up to day um we've been very close uh, i have been very close to his family and he has been to mine um and it was a wonderful relationship i was very blessed as a matter of fact to have that kind of relationship with my advisor thank you very much okay okay um Hi, right, Professor. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Absolutely. So I just want, wanted to ask, um, I mean, if I can track back into the presentation, I just want to, want to understand the difference between like cognition and intelligence as regards to the work you've done. Um, I cannot hear you very well because you are breaking up, but you wanted me, could you repeat again? Um, you wanted me to speak more about the difference between cognition and intelligence. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I'm thinking of cognition as a hardware that you have in place. Um, but intelligence yeah. is the abilities um, that you acquire because of this hardware. So um, what that means, say when a baby is born today, for example, they have the hardware in place, all right? They have the ability to learn, but they're not intelligent. They have 
they react to the environment, but they cannot think on their own. Or I think of a baby that is just born. A baby that is just born has two things in there, very important. Has the hardware in place, all right? And the hardware that can grow, obviously, with the size when they grow older. But it has the hardware in place. So I would say as a species, a baby has cognition, has the ability to learn and to think. Now, is it ready to do it right there? No. Um, so I would not say that the baby is intelligent um, because that implies that it has the ability to make decisions on its own. But I will say that the baby has the, is, is cognitive. It has cognition. It has the ability to think. It has the ability to make a decision, assuming that it's going to learn the things that he or she will need to learn eventually. And you see the learning in um, babies from very young to very to much due the first few years. You know, the repetition of things, how repetitive they how repetitive they are doing one thing. I have three granddaughters. And I observe them every time, you know, I can, I meet them. Uh, I meet, I go and see my children. Um, there is one thing that they can do like 20 times, the same thing. Um, the other day they were, uh, my one of them, the youngest, one and a half, she wanted, she was asking her mom, my daughter, to connect the, um, the power to the phone here, the connector to put it in, and then she wanted to move it out. And then she wanted to put it in again and move it out. She did that 20 times, continuously. I mean, I was thinking, and my daughter said, oh, well, you know, I cannot do that. I said, no, this is important for them. This is, excuse me, the lights went off here in my room, just one second, okay. So I was telling, this is how they, that's the, that's how I would make the differentiation between having the cognition and having the intelligence. So intelligence is the result of having the hardware and the software in place after you go through the learning process. Cognition is the abilities that you have already embedded. All right. So um, you are a cognitive species because you have the ability eventually to become intelligent. So that's how I differentiate them. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kathy. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I'm gonna I'm gonna add the comment, not really a question. I like the the fact that you uh, mentioned uh, your advisor, uh, and it's something that I say also to the students that your advisor is like your academic father or your academic mother it will be there uh, every time and any time uh, to support you when you fall and uh, absolutely celebrate with you when you succeed and uh it, it was very nice listening the same thing from you that you are so successful that you refer back to your to your advisor that's that's something very nice oh, absolutely i call him now he's in later age and i ask him how he's doing you know we just uh uh had his birthday the other time and then a lot of us got together <laughs> and He's a wonderful man, I have to tell you. I owe to him that I came to the U.S. He he was a I could not say a father because you know he was not that much older than I was, but he became he became like an older brother to me, and to my husband, and he helped us tremendously. And so, from that point of view, what I would suggest always to graduate students is that find the right advisor. Um, find a person, I mean, the being able to connect with a person is not so much, um, my advisor was an assist, associate professor when I came to work with him. He was not at the time, now he's a member of the academy, but at the time he was a young faculty member. 
he was not a very famous, you know, faculty. I did not go to work with him because of that. As a matter of fact, I was not even thinking that way. Uh, I was thinking more as a person that was uninformed <laughs> about how the graduate school worked. But um, my instincts were telling me that it's important to work with a person whom I respect, who respects me, and who is a person I can rely on. From that point on, I was very lucky, obviously, because he was wonderful. A lot of times you, and I, but, but I, I would have also to say that I was committed to not stay with a person that would not be a good person to me. Um, and it's not so much, you know, the technical, it's everything else. The support they give, the emotional support, because that's what you need. When, at a time when you are at the lowest, <laughs> there are times as a graduate student that you go very low. I remember, um, well, my husband and I, as I said, we were married as graduate students, but, and we did not want to have children before we would finish, but, you know, we, I start, I, well, I got pregnant um, before I, I had my PhD. So we decided, of course, no, what we would do, we, we didn't know what to do. Obviously, we we're both graduate students. We had no money, all right? And But we had a baby coming. My advisor was the most wonderful person during that period of my life. Um, even if we've learned that I, we were expecting when I was a year away from practically finishing, um, even more than that. And I did not even have enough data to know at the time. I did not even know whether it would take me two more years, three more years to finish. I did not have any indications that I was ready because I was working on um, my thesis, but I did not have enough data to show that, you know, I was ready to demonstrate what I needed to demonstrate at the time. My advisor was wonderful. And I have to tell you, I owe it to him for that. And for yeah. many other things he tried to do to help me. That's very nice to hear. Uh, from my side, I cannot thank you more for accepting this invitation and having you here today. It was indeed a wonderful talk, thank very so inspirational much. and the whole the whole path. Uh, you know, as I say to this uh, uh, group, uh, because we are a small group, and there is a reason that we are small because it's women in engineering. So, of course. I hope, <laughs> yeah, I hope that we will grow. But you know, finding healthy role models it's it's very very important for putting the bar high and see what you, where you can reach or even further. So it's very very useful for our students having so healthy role models. And I have to tell you that. Um... I have also enjoyed working with um, young women, as well as young men, obviously, in the university. But always in my group, I had many more women than the average faculty member. <laughs> so this yeah, time, in my group, we are 60% women. And I you love tell us the way you do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, um, it's, it's a combination of recruiting them. I recruit brilliant minds always, and I see them very early. And I go to them and say, you know, um, you want to come and work in my team. And uh, other times, you know, when they see that also the, the group is more diverse, they come, they feel comfortable. Yeah. They bring their friends. We, we, we have a great group right now. That's great. Thank you again so much. And Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Katehi. You're truly an inspiration for us. And I, I really thank you for joining us to motivate me as well as all of our audience today. It was truly very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, this video has been recorded and I will be uploading it to YouTube so that if anyone here uh, wants to rewatch it, I, I believe a lot of them would want to. So you, you can find it on our channel. Absolutely. And, and then I may be able to put it also to connect to it. Uh, we are doing a 
for uh, my group, um, we are doing a website, so I should be able to put it on our website as well. Sure, I can share it with you as well. Excellent. So, Thank you. Yeah, as well as soon as it's up, I will be sharing it with you. Thank you very much. Thank you and good night. Thank good you. night, everybody. Good night. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And I will be closing it. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.